It's time to take a truly fascinating look into the minds of Hollywood executives, and awards season continues to ramp up with the announcement of the Spirit Awards. But in this episode of the Weekly News Wrap-Up, we are going to be touching on the Department of Justice decision to take away the Paramount decision. And if you don't know what any of those words mean, I implore you to stick around to the end of this episode because we are going to be talking about something that affects the movie-going experience very seriously. Before we get to all of the film news, I'd like to remind you that I am TJ, this is Cinematech, and we put out all kinds of great film-related content. Next week, we're going to be putting out a couple of special videos that are wrapping up my experience at the Blood in the Snow Film Festival. I suggest you hit the subscribe button and tap that little notification bell. Actually, you know what? Why don't you just stab that notification bell? That's the right thing to do here. I've already seen one great film of Blood in the Snow called Puppet Killer. You're gonna wanna come back and hear my thoughts on it because that film is fantastic. Lee hilarious. I really loved it. But enough of the self-promotion, it's time to get into the film news and we're going to start off with the Spirit Awards announcing their nominees. These are the awards that are handed out the day before the Oscars and they only focus on independent films, so no studio junk getting in the way. They have a lot of categories, but we're going to focus on the best feature and best first feature categories and talk about some interesting omissions along the way. So first we have best feature and the films nominated are a Hidden Life by Terrence Malick, Clemency by Chinyon Yi Chuku, The Farewell by Lulu Wang, Marriage Story by Noah Baumbach, and Uncut Gems by the Safdie Brothers. The nominations for the Best First Feature category are Booksmart by Olivia Wilde, The Climb by Michael Angelo Covino, Diane by Kent Jones, The Last Black Man in San Francisco by Joe Talbot, The Mustang by Laure de Clementonnet, and You See Yesterday by Stefan Bristol. Now as for interesting notes from all of the nominations, I think we first have to look at Noah Baumbach being nominated for Best Picture for Marriage Story, being nominated for Best Screenplay for Marriage Story, but not getting a Best Director nod. That seems kind of strange. We then have Elizabeth Moss being nominated for her role in Her Smell. This is a film I saw at TIFF in 2018. I thought this film had gone completely under the radar, and I am so happy that she got a nomination for this role. If you've ever worn a Nirvana or a Bikini Kill shirt, you owe it to yourself to see this film. Elizabeth Moss's performance is excellent. I think everyone should check it out. The Vietnamese film The Third Wife got nominations for Best Editing and Best Cinematography, but wasn't included in the category for Best International Film. In fact, as far as I can tell, it's the only international film to be nominated in categories outside of Best International Film. Even Parasite didn't get any other kind of nominations. So that's real weird. Robert Pattinson and Willem Dafoe were both nominated for their roles in The Lighthouse, but Robert Pattinson got the lead nomination and Willem Dafoe got the supporting nomination. And I think there was some debate as to who would get what or if they would both be pushed for lead nominations. These Spirit Award nominations tell me that Pattinson is being pushed for lead and Defoe is being pushed for supporting and we can expect to see similar campaigns to get them into the Oscars for those same categories. And a quick note from the Best International Film category, the film Retablo by Alvaro Delgado Apricio from Peru is a pretty low profile pick to actually get into that category. All of the other films I have either seen or I have heard about, and it's interesting that it was able to get in over other films like Manos, which had a pretty wide theatrical distribution for an independent film. So please check out the nominations in the link in the description below, and let me know what you think about them. Were there any other weird oddities that you found that you'd like to discuss? Love to talk about that in the comments. Moving on, we now have a pretty good idea how much cocaine was being snorted in Hollywood in the 1990s because we recently found out that Julia Roberts was initially slated to play the role of Harriet Tubman in the film Harriet. Gregory Allen Howard, the writer and producer of Harriet, revealed that in a 1994 meeting regarding the film, a Hollywood executive pitched the idea of Julia Roberts playing the role of Harriet Tubman. The issue here, if you're not aware, is that Julia Roberts is super white and Harriet Tubman was an African-American former slave who escaped slavery in the South and then ventured back south in order to lead people out of the south using the Underground Railroad. According to Howard, when the sole African American in the meeting pointed out that maybe Julia Roberts shouldn't be playing a black woman, the producer retorted, ah, that was such a long time ago. Who's going to remember that kind of stuff? And to this I say, I really hope that person no longer has a job and is in any way involved in the film industry that is egregious on a level that it is comedic if it wasn't so sad. But please, let us know what you think in the comments below. How much cocaine do you think this man put in his nose? Without having any knowledge of the drug industry, I'm going to guess 3 million pounds. Is that a lot? 
Moving on, Nicolas Cage is in talks to play the role that he was always born to play himself. And I have to say, I love this. I love this a lot. I try to keep emotion out of this channel, but by God, I love this idea. First of all, the title of the film, The Unbearable Weight of Massive Talent. Incredible. The next amazing thing, the plot synopsis. According to Slash Film, it reads, Cage would play a fictionalized version of himself having to reckon with his career choices, which makes me think, oh, maybe he's going for an Oscar in this. Maybe it's going to be a serious dramatic role. But then, while also getting mixed up with the CIA and a drug cartel kingpin. Nice. Overall, this reminds me a lot of the film JCVD, in which Jean-Claude Van Damme played himself and actually had to reckon with his, his fame and his notoriety in his native Brussels. I won't get into the plot of that film, but if you haven't seen it, you absolutely must. And please let me know what you think about this in the comments below. Are you so excited to see this that you are basically begging Hollywood to fast track it and make it immediately? Because that's what I'm doing. I think I'm gonna dedicate an entire Twitter account to it. I'm gonna build it from scratch and we're gonna get this done. We're gonna get this to screen real quick. And now we're moving on to the big story of the week. And if the last story was a bit of sugar, then this one is definitely going to be the bitter pill that you have to swallow with it. The American Department of Justice has announced that it is going to be wiping out the Paramount decision, also known as the United States versus Paramount Pictures, Inc., a Supreme Court antitrust case that was ruled on in 1948. That court decision had a huge effect on how films are distributed inside the United States. And to this day, it's still seen as a landmark decision when it comes to vertical integration antitrust trust suits. For context, vertical integration is a business arrangement where a business owns all aspects of its own supply chain. So to put this in film terms, if a movie studio owned the movie theater where their films were being shown, then they would be considered vertically integrated. To best understand this, let's first look at what was happening before the Paramount decision was enacted in 1948. First, movie studios actually owned movie theaters and then would rent them to exhibitors. This arrangement allowed for film distribution practices like circuit dealing, block booking, and the overall discrimination against small independent theaters. Circuit dealing has to do with the practice of setting it up so that a film doesn't compete with itself in a given market. So for example, let's say that you're RKO and you own five theaters in a city and you have Citizen Kane coming out. You would then demand of those theaters that none of those screenings of Citizen Kane would overlap with each other, so that your own theaters are not competing with each other. So instead you would have one theater showing Citizen Kane at one time, another theater showing Citizen Kane at another time, and in those other screenings you're showing another film, thus forcing people to see whatever you happen to be showing in their local theater. Or you're forcing them to travel, potentially a long way to see the film that they want to see. Then we have block booking, which was the practice of selling an entire slate of films to a theater. And what studios would actually do here is say, hey look, we've got this huge blockbuster film that we know is gonna make you a lot of money, but if you want it, you must also take all of these really bad garbage films that we've made. And studios would do this because they knew that they could guarantee a certain number of screenings for those bad films, thus guaranteeing themselves that they would make their own money back. Now one of the big issues here is that obviously theaters couldn't control what they were showing, but they were also deciding on what movies to show sight unseen, also called blind bidding. So the theaters wouldn't even know what they were going to be showing on their screens for an entire calendar year in most cases. And when it comes to discrimination against small independent theaters, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If you own the films and you're trying to put those films in your own theaters, you are going to be less receptive to the small business owner who's trying to compete against you. So with the Paramount decision, all of these practices, along with the ability for a studio to own a movie theater, pretty much all disappeared and were outlawed. As an example for my older millennial audience, you might remember as a kid, going to a film in the Paramount theaters. That chain was actually originally owned by Paramount Studios, but when the Paramount decision came through, they had to be broken up into two separate companies. The consequences of this decision included that studios started making less films because they could no longer rely on those reliable profits from making really bad movies. This decision also essentially ended what was called the golden age of Hollywood, and laid the groundwork for what would become a major film movement called the 
new American cinema. If you want to see more content on this channel about film movements, let me know in the comments below because that's something that I would definitely like to talk about. And so the major thing to glean from all of that is that independent cinema as we know it today probably wouldn't exist if not for the Paramount decision. Would Quentin Tarantino have been able to make Reservoir Dogs? Would Moonlight have been able to win Best Picture at the Oscars? Would an independent distributor like A24 even be able to exist in that climate? Probably not. And therefore, the entire filmmaking landscape as we know it, at least in America, would be far different. And as we all know, what happens in America culturally affects the world culturally. So what would removing these protections actually lead to? Ben Pearson at Slash Film outlined the pros and cons pretty succinctly. The pros, as he mentioned, are basically limited to the fact that Netflix and Amazon would be able to start buying theaters and then putting their exclusive content into those theaters. That would then put an end to this whole ridiculous charade that we've been playing where we pretend that Netflix and Amazon films are just TV movies. Mr. Spielberg, you gotta cut that shit out, bro. Beyond that, it's all cons. We would see a return of anti-competitive practices like block booking and circuit dealing. And as we know, when businesses are allowed to be anti-competitive, the price for the consumer just goes up. So we could see a fundamental shift in how much it costs to go to the movies. Beyond that, it would allow companies like Disney, who now owns Fox Searchlight, to demand that small independent theaters show bigger blockbuster films like Star Wars and the Marvel films in order to show those smaller independent films which likely just means that the smaller independent films aren't gonna get shown as much because there will be less screens for them overall. We know this because Disney has gotten into the habit of making huge demands of theaters, like having minimum guaranteed run times, like four weeks for The Last Jedi, while also taking a bigger cut of the overall profits that a film like that makes. As you can see, I'm basically laying into Disney here because they are in fact an evil company and their monopoly and their designs on the media industry must be stopped. All in all, this affects small business owners the most, especially when we're talking about theaters that exist in small towns. For those towns that only have one theater that services them, they have to deal with these big companies and they are not able to turn over films as often as they would need to because they have a smaller overall audience coming to see those films. So if you're playing Star Wars for four weeks straight and you know that your town is going to come see it within the first week, you just have three weeks of empty screenings and there's nothing you can do about it because those are the terms that Disney demanded. Now there's a lot of other information about this. I've put it all in the description below. Unfortunately, I can't take too much more time to talk about it as I'm about to be kicked out of the room that we're filming this in, but I just want to remind you that this is an important legal decision and that you potentially have the power to change it. If you live in America, please contact your members of Congress and maybe get out and vote for the 2020 election because the person in the White House decides who runs the DOJ. And we all know that policy can change. So with that said, that's the end of the weekly news wrap up. I actually have to get out of here and then edit this thing and then go to Blood in the Snow and watch two more, hopefully, pretty good films tonight. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and make sure to hit me up on Twitter and Instagram. I do different things on each. I do film reviews on Twitter and I just talk about old movies on Instagram for the most part. As always, I appreciate you stopping by. I'm not gonna be talking about what films are coming out this week because I just remembered that I forgot to do that again, but I'll put those in the description below as well. And hey, let's just talk about movies. Let's have a fun time. And let's continue to support the independent distributors who are doing the heavy lifting as far as making great films. I probably haven't said it enough, but you can gleam it. I don't trust the studio system to do what's best for the art form of film. And with that, I wish you all a great weekend, and I'll see you next week.